A cousin Hevont, Leon in English, served the Armenian community of the second city of the Ottoman Empire, Smyrna, modern Izmir, and found himself amongst the hundreds of thousands of Christians who jammed the quayside and many of whom were literally thrust into the sea as Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's forces set fire to the city behind them in 1922. Leon Turian was plucked out of the water, taken to Manchester in England, ordained, survived to become archbishop and leader of the American Diocese of America. Because of political differences with the ARF, he was murdered while celebrating the Divine Liturgy at Holy Cross Church of Armenia in Upper Manhattan on the 24th of December, 1933. The crime split the Armenian diaspora at its heart, and the wounds have never entirely healed. There's a strange sidelight to this particular tragedy of the Turian family, and one that has only just come to light. In 1944, Jack Kerouac and William S. Burroughs, who were to go on to fame in the pantheon of American literature, with their novels On the Road and Naked Lunch, co-authored their first major piece of prose, entitled, And the Hippos Were Boiled in Their Tanks. This novel, the first novel of the Beat Movement, one of the most important in American culture, deals with the traumatic and formative event of that movement, the murder in 1944 of one of their friends, David Kammerer, by another of their friends, Lucian Carr, in Riverside Park near the Columbia campus in Upper Manhattan, about three miles from Holy Cross Church. Carr was a handsome, pale, delicate featured boy of 19. Kammerer, an older, gay man and a childhood friend of Burroughs, who had for several years been a mentor and possibly a lover of Carr. Burroughs and Kerouac were arrested as accessories to the crime since they had failed to turn in Carr after he told them about the murder, but they were quickly let off the hook. Although Burroughs was gay and Kerouac bisexual, both thought it best to try to save their friend Carr from the hot seat, from uh, going to the electric chair, by letting the murder be presented not as a lover's quarrel, but as a typical case of a young straight man defending himself against the advances, advances of a predatory older one. Carr ended up doing prison time. This lurid murder, called the Ivy League murder, competed for headlines for a short time with the Allied advance that had just begun across France and was quickly forgotten. The novel itself, though, was not published till about a month and a half ago, the fall of 2008. And by then, of course, the real life players were dead. All the characters in the book, naturally, are thinly concealed by fictional names. Lucien Carr, the killer, is called Philip Turian, and is variously described by the authors as a Turk, or as having Greek relatives, or as hailing from Istanbul. The character in the novel is 17, Carr was 19 at the time, and is described over and over as swarthy and handsome, whereas Carr actually had a light complexion. So the fictional character is different enough from the real historical one that one has to ask why the authors invented him as they did. Perhaps they knew that Turian was an Armenian surname, and in the novel, William Saroyan, an American Armenian, is mentioned in passing, though without any reference to his ancestry. At the time, Saroyan was a very famous American writer, of course, and is still famous, and no one needed to identify him as Armenian. He was known to everyone. The name Turian, however, is an obscure one, at least to non ar uh, Armenian readers now, and so far, after a gulf of 70 years, the fictional name of the killer has evaded mainstream critical notice. Now, it doesn't mean anything to anybody now. But only 10 years after the events on West 187th Street, 
It was not obscure at all. If the novel had been published then, everyone would instantly have recognized what the name meant, and it would still have evoked gut feelings of horror and scandal, especially to a reader in New York City, where the events occurred. Indeed, it would take considerable special pleading to suggest that Burroughs and Kerouac could have had in mind anything other than the murder at the altar when they ironically assigned the name of the victim to the killer in their novel. The name Turian is not one that one plucks out of a hat. This strange and unexpected echo of the tragedy that befell the Turian family and the larger Armenian community brings us also into the era of the second great genocide of the 20th century, the Nazi Holocaust. A crime of mass murder cannot occur without the indifference of the wider world. And perhaps the malign indifference and base prejudice of some Western opinion in particular, the genteel hatred that welcomed fascism to Europe, is best illustrated by the work of one of the greatest poets in English of the interwar period, and indeed of the century, T.S. Eliot. Eliot was a brutal, vicious anti-Semite, Harvard educated, whose racist animosities differed very little from Hitler's. In the poem Garantion, 1920, he writes, my house is a decayed house, and the Jew squats on the windowsill, the owner, spawned in some estaminate of Antwerp, blistered in Brussels, patched and peeled in London. And in another poem, Burbank with a Bedecker, Bleistein with a cigar, published in the same year, are these noxious lines. The rats are underneath the piles. The Jew is underneath the lot. And in both poems, the word Jew is spelled with a lowercase letter. He is not a human being, but a thing. Now, T.S. Eliot's animus did not extend only to Jews by any means. In 1922, he published his long poem, the poem that has brought him the greatest fame, The Wasteland, in part three of which the narrator, who is the ancient blind hermaphrodite prophet of Thebes, Tiresias, recounts this. Mr. Eukhanidis, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven, with a pocket full of currents, CIF London, documents at sight, asked me in demotic French to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. Once one unpacks these somewhat cryptic lines, they are found to be quite as hateful as the earlier verses that I cited. Evgenidis, the name that Eliot sneeringly employs, is Greek and means son of a nobleman or one of noble birth. But this Smyrniot is no gentry. He's a lower middle class merchant and an unshaven loutish one at that. As for his merchandise, carriage and insurance free to London, that's what CIF means, it's a pitiful handful of raisins in his pocket. Evgenidi seems not to have mastered fully any tongue. The Levantine mongrel speaks only a demotic French, that is a debased lingua franca sort of French. And he's soliciting Tiresias for what Eliot would have considered sterile and unnatural intercourse. Now, of course, of course, all of this is a classic carbon copy of the same notions that anti-Semites cherished. And indeed, one can read them in the dispatches of American politicians stationed at Constantinople at the end of World War I. Mark Bristol said that Armenians were little better than Jews. Jews, Armenians, Greeks are connected not to land, but to money. They're dirty and beggarly. They're at home nowhere. They speak all languages, but all equally poorly. And they're corrupting and perverted. 